Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, and I am Chad Miller. I'm an assistant professor at Kansas State University in ornamental horticulture, and today, first half of this webinar, I will present uh, information on what are those bumps, blisters, and lesions that you might experience in a, in a production system. As many of you have certainly heard, uh, there are multiple different uh, physiological disorders out there. Uh, the first two that you see here on this list, edema and intumescence, who you're probably certainly aware of, and those will be the first, uh, those will be the couple that uh, myself and Dr. Williams certainly uh, talk about today based on research that we've done uh, in recent years. Uh, however, there are many other uh, types of physiological disorders out there, including enations, galls, neoplasms, uh, including genetic tumors and excrescences. And we find these physiological disorders that across many different plant species, across many different plant families. And so it's not targeted to one uh, narrow range of, of, or group of plants. In addition, we see these uh, physiological disorders on many different parts of the plants, leaves, stems, fruits, uh, etc. So they're not uh, targeted to one specific area on a plant either. With many different physiological disorders out there, of course, there's more than likely numerous causative factors. And so as we start looking through literature and considering what those factors might be, here you see a list of many of those proposed uh, factors. And so one common one is the excess water uh, notion, and we will certainly cover that in, in relation to edema. Okay, uh, certainly something uh, many of you have uh, probably experienced or are aware of. Uh, another factor is air contamination. Okay, if we have poor air quality, uh, certainly including particulates in the air, certainly also ozone potential, uh, may also cause some sense of uh, disorder development on plants. Hormones, uh, plants are, have multiple different types of hormones and any sort of combination or balance or imbalance, uh, various stages of growth uh, and development uh, may have effect on the various hormone levels in, in the plant which then could cause or relate to uh, these disorder, uh, disorders and their development. Uh, and then of course light and temperature, two major factors in plant growth and development uh, seem very obvious as uh, factors in these developments. Uh, uh, these these lesions or bumps. Uh, carbohydrate balance, okay, so as plants are looking uh, or are in perhaps in the transition from vegetative or, or leafy growth to reproductive growth, how is the plant uh, uh, partitioning or moving these carbohydrates around these photosynthesis photosynthase that they are making, uh, how does that play into this? Um, what's going on below ground? Are, are structures being formed down, uh, you know, tubers, uh, uh, enlarged roots, things like that? Uh, so that certainly could have a factor in, in the development of these uh, disorders. Not to forget chemical applications. We're certainly uh, applying plant growth regulators, that's certainly uh, a factor in that. Of course, correct chemical applications, not uh, too severe or um, detrimental. We also have pest chemical applications as well, pesticides that could certainly have a factor in the development of these. And of course genetics. Uh, with any given plant, uh, any plant species for that matter, uh, even within the species, you know, typically multiple different cultivars and cultivars certainly respond differently to various uh, cultural uh, activities and so uh, would certainly any number of these causative factors might have a, a play on these uh, development of these disorders. And, and that goes without saying that any number of these causative factors may be working together. So generally not just one of these are uh, going to be the, the ultimate cause for these uh, bumps uh, and blisters and lesions. Of course, d plants uh, have diseases and enations are one of those uh, responses uh, that look very similar to some of these uh, intumescences or edema or some of these other physiological disorders. And so here on the screen you can see two different species with a, a various virus infection. Uh, we see these enations, these, these raised uh, pimply or blister-like lesions near the, the veination or the veins uh, on the leaves and often have some vascular tissue associated with those. And so we certainly see uh, these bumps and blisters uh, resulting from disease infections. And of course, arthropods or, or pest feeding. Uh, this slide here, we have a, a thrips. Uh, so the thrips is identified there, the little yellow spot with the arrow pointing to it. And then uh, the ultimate resulting damage or destruction by these pests, uh, the feeding, uh, lighted there by the uh, arrowhead, uh, certainly 
leaves some sort of damage to the plant which could be interpreted as some sort of physiological uh, disorder as well. And so keeping all these in mind uh, as potential causative factors is important. So as we looked at all these different causative factors and we're certainly going to uh, highlight some of the work uh, our former graduate student Joshua Craver uh, worked on for his master's degree. One thing became very clear uh, as we look at various studies and occurrences of these disorders is that they almost always occurred in a controlled environment. Okay, So we're looking at greenhouses, high tunnels, uh, growth chambers, uh, something in that regard. And so as we look at these controlled, controlled environments, the question then becomes what's the common thread or what's the, what's the linkage uh, in these controlled environments that might ex better explain why these uh, lesions or bumps or blisters are actually happening. And so one that really stood out was this light quality uh, and or quantity uh, sort of factor. And so that became uh, a major focus of, of Joshua's master's research and certainly present more information on that, uh, uh, Dr. Williams will, in the, in the second part of this uh, webinar. As Josh progressed, kind of transition a little bit here to into, into some of the, the work that Josh did and in, in, uh, overall discussion of these uh, these uh, disorders. Uh, Josh looked at uh, trying to better describe these disorders, especially on uh, sweet, ornamental sweet potato epomias. Uh, and so through his research, we ultimately decided that the, uh, the disorder was actually probably better termed into mescence on, on epomia. Um, and so this, this slide here shows a normal ornamental sweet potato leaf on the left and then uh, an intumescent uh, one on the right, and the red arrow uh, certainly highlights that disorder. Again, we're certainly seeing it near the veination or the veins on, on the leaf. However, if you look lower on the leaf, we certainly do see it in the intervenal areas as well, maybe more so on the secondary veins. Um, but these ab abnormal growths, as I previously mentioned, certainly occur on the leaves. Uh, we noticed and observed them on the stems of the, in, uh, of the sweet potato, uh, also the cufia, uh, and then, of course, uh, the petioles uh, of these leaves as well. To date, the, especially with uh, ornamental sweet potato, we have no known pathogen or, or interaction with, uh, with those uh, in ornamental sweet potato and cufia. And so thus, it's at this point only uh, environmental conditions that are leading to these, these disorders. So one might ask, what is, what is the impact or what, what sort of negative effects do we see with, this, uh, with these disorders? And so um, first and foremost, we'll start to see some sense of chlorosis. And uh, as we look at these different effects, uh, the figure on the right, we see a, a very advanced uh, or a very heavily infested um, uh, case of intumescence on, on ornamental sweet potato. And so uh, we will certainly see later in later stages of development and in, uh, infection, if you will, uh, chlorosis or yellowing of the leaf, which then ultimately leads into senescence and then potentially leaf abscission. Um, and then the fourth point there, the downward curling is in the, in the leaf to the right certainly exhibits that. Uh, almost an epin, uh, epinastic sort of look that we might see with like poinsettias or some sort of ethylene damage to plants. And so uh, that was very typical to see that in, in a highly uh, developed incidence of, of uh, intumescence on these leaves. And so all of those negative eff effects essentially ultimately result in impaired photosynthesis. And so if we have impaired photosynthesis, especially in, in large situations or large uh, scale uh, intumescence development, that impact on these ornamentals, especially leafy ornamentals like uh, ornamental sweet potatoes, uh, can certainly result uh, in crop loss ultimately, but also aesthetic uh, quality of the plant and then ultimately the economic value. As we observe these, these higher infestations of, of um, intumescence, uh, an average consumer would certainly look at that and perhaps draw the conclusion the plant is virused or diseased or something and then pass uh, on purchasing it, thus uh, reducing the, the saleability uh, of the plant. This slide here certainly shows you uh, the levels. All right, uh, We'll kind of walk through the, the various stages of development of these intumescences, but the overall impact, uh, the severe uh, stages of this, these disorders, uh, intumescence development. The upper panel, we see the uh, tomato, um, and notice the, the large necrotic areas that have essentially coalesced and, and 
if one considers that sort of large uh, dead area on leaves and and so looking at tomatoes in a greenhouse or high tunnel sort of production system, uh, the more chlorosis, the more necrotic area, less photosynthesis, generally less fruit development, and so we can certainly uh, see and understand the economic value and loss there. Uh, the panel to the right, we see QFU, and then the lower panel uh, on the left there, uh, lower left is the ornamental sweet potato. And again, both of these are in later stages of development. You start seeing the necrosis and the larger coalescing of, the, of these intumescences uh, on the leaves. To kind of give you the range of severity, we have two different QFU varieties here, and we, we observe these in a local greenhouse, actually. And so uh, the the, slide, or the photo on the left, we see a QFU melvilla. Um, and we observe most of the intumescence on the lower side of the leaves. Uh, we see considerably less compared to the right uh, flamenco samba cultivar. Uh, we see considerably less uh, intumescence development there on the abaxial side of the leaf. Compared to the right uh, picture on the right, uh, we see the flamenco samba uh, cultivar. And in the foreground, you certainly see a lot of a really uh, bad uh, case of, of intumescent development and even in the, back, in the background you can see on many of the other leaves uh, a very severe case and so quite honestly uh, very much a, a concern in, in saleability of these plants. The next couple of slides will kind of highlight a major portion of Joshua's research and, and uh, walk through three, to, three of these species, the cufia, the epomia, and the, and the tomato. But essentially what we have in the next three slides, on the left-hand side we have more of a macroscopic view of, of individual leaves and uh, intumescence development. And on the right-hand side we see a more of a microscopic or closer-up view of the various stages. And then from top to bottom we see the initial to more mature to final, you know, later stages of development of this of intumescence. And so you can see here with the Cufia javia cultivar tiny mice, um, the in initial stages, uh, light, light green, small pimples or, or blisters start to develop. And as we progress, we get uh, to more coalesced and necrotic uh, tissue here in the lower right hand panel, letter F. Similar with tomato, right, cultivar maxifor, uh, rootstock variety, very similar uh, sort of progression again. Uh, in this case, we see most of these uh, intumescences developing on the abaxial side of the leaf. Uh, and again, uh, smaller initial stages in the top panel and then larger coalesced necrotic areas uh, on the right-hand side in panel F. And then finally, the ornamental sweet potato, Epomia uh, cultivar blackie. Again, you can see uh, the progression of this, uh, of this disorder. Again, uh, I'd like to highlight panel D, the cent center one there, those, that close-up of those uh, intumescence, that uh, translucent, uh, large, extended cellular uh, growth, essentially, that has happened generally about a millimeter-ish uh, in, in height. And then the lower panel F, they become necrotic and essentially dead. And so these, this, is, this is sort of the development or progress that we've seen with the uh, intumescence on these three cultivars. Considering the numerous uh, causative factors, one that was highlighted, the last one that was highlighted uh, on that list was the genetics. And so as we sort of characterized these lesions or these bumps, we became curious about, well, with ornamental sweet potato, what, what is the range of susceptibility, if you will, uh, for the various cultivars? And so we were able to obtain pretty close to all, uh, pretty close to all the cultivars uh, commercially available. And so we ran a, a cultivar screening trial. First and foremost, we wanted to, to document uh, the occurrence and severity of the intumescence for each cultivar, but then we also wanted to describe and characterize the foliage type and plant growth just to see if we had any sort of correlation or connection between the, the development uh, of these ornamental sweet potatoes. This next slide kind of highlights the, the information that uh, we obtained through this uh, selection or the, the screening uh, progress. So essentially these plants were grown for six weeks uh, under in greenhouse conditions and to uh, further uh, remove UV we put up a UV blocking uh, plastic. And so what I'd like to highlight here is essentially those that are above this red line okay, uh, and those that are below. So uh, we, we basically made the cutoff line for commercially acceptable being 5% intumescence uh, occurrence on their leaves. So if you look at the far right-hand column, you, column, you will see the, the percent of intumescent leaves that have developed on these plants. And so, yes, uh, with the assistance of an intern and, and with Joshua's uh, assistance as well, uh, total number of leaves were counted, and so we certainly see uh, 
heavy uh, incidence of intumescent leaves with certain cultivars, namely Blackie and, and a few of these others. So uh, below the red line, we see 5% or less, which we deemed as, as not uh, commercially significant, that uh, that would that would be a, a lesion or two here or there on the plant, thus uh, to the average person, probably not even noticeable. So. What did we conclude from this? Uh, as I mentioned, basically 5%, uh, the, the cultivars with 5% intumescent leaves were, were not considerably, uh, considered commercially acceptable. Um, and of all the cultivars, about a quarter of them fell into uh, the, the highly intumescent or susceptible uh, category. Uh, a couple other things to note about the, relating to the genetic side, Blackie and Blackheart, a couple of older cultivars, uh, tended to have a heavier incidence of intumescence development. Alternatively, uh, Margarita, we didn't see as much. So not sure of the entire background or breeding process, but perhaps some of these older cultivars like Blackie and Black Heart uh, were used in, in the genetics, and so uh, might be something, uh, further investigation of that genetic inheritance uh, would be interesting to understand. We've published a couple of uh, articles on that. You could reference them in the GPN, Greenhouse Product News, uh, both in uh, 2013 and 2014 for more information. Of course, you could also contact myself or Dr. Williams uh, for more information. One other causative factor, and this will kind of shift us or transition us over to Dr. Williams, another major uh, causative factor is that excess water uh, consideration that is typically associated with edema. Okay? Uh, edema is often characterized as these raised uh, and then ultimately sunken uh, lesions. All right, Think of a water balloon um, and then ultimately resulting in these, these lesions on the plant and then sunken characteristics with those. Ultimately, or the, the, the dogma behind that, or the basic principle is essentially that a plant will absorb water faster than it can actually be assimilated or used in the plant, uh, basically resulting in cell turgor increasing, and then too much water, too much water, and the cell bursts, and then we have that collapse. So typically seen in situations where there's overwatering and high humidity and generally cooler temperatures and lower light, essentially low transpiration rates, but uh, increased water uptake. With that, I would like to thank you, and I would be able to entertain any questions at this point.